This program, Office Productivity and Ergonomics, is one of a series of tapes that will demonstrate the unequaled position of Westinghouse Furniture Systems as a leader in productivity and in the blending of technology, furniture, and people to create productive work environments. As noted in the introductory tape, the series covers one, office automation technology, the integration of new technology into the office environment, two, office productivity and ergonomics, the concept that office design and furniture must accommodate the needs of people, and three, an overview of the Bosti study, a study that tells us that satisfaction with the design of the office environment does count, for it affects job performance and job satisfaction. At Westinghouse, productivity is not a word. It's a corporate way of life. That's the reason why Westinghouse is productivity, not because we say it, but because we do it. At Westinghouse, we understand that productivity is neither a commodity nor a destination. Rather, productivity is the ongoing byproduct of corporate commitment and management understanding. Corporate commitment to giving good people the best tools and equipment to get the job done. Getting the job done correctly and on schedule. Getting the right answer more often. Machines do not get the job done, people do. At Westinghouse, we know the importance of people power. We know how human performance is enhanced when given the right tools. As furniture systems specialists, our role is to help clients understand how Westinghouse Furniture Systems can maximize the effectiveness and productivity of a corporation's most powerful and costly resource, its people. To assist us in this process, we have asked Franz Schneider to share his project experience and research with us. I've personally been on client calls with Franz, and this is the message that executives stop and listen to. When I walked into this room today, I brought with me a set of abilities and liabilities. These abilities and liabilities have been defined by millions of years of biological development and thousands of years of social interaction. This history has defined what I am good at and what I am not good at. Recognizing that we have biologically based needs, weaknesses and strengths, designs such as this hand tool are hard to understand. This hand tool has nothing at all to do with the human hand. It is too large to grasp, and nobody in North America has the grip strength necessary to pull it closed. There are two ways of looking at this problem. One is to say that the human does not fit the hand tool, and that the person should adapt to fit the job. This is called absenteeism and degenerative disease. The other approach is to say the hand tool must fit the human. This is referred to as good design and good management and is often summarized as the ergonomics approach. Just as a hand tool must fit the human hand, so too must systems, buildings, and the work environment meet human needs. The metaphor of the hand tool applies to every piece of technology in the workplace today. When we look at office buildings, we recognize there's one and only one reason for an office building, and that's to house and support people. There's no such thing as a productive office building. There's no such thing as a productive computer. There are only people that are more or less productive depending on the equipment and the furnishings and the environment that we provide them with. If we take all of our costs to run an office building, if we add up our costs for consumables, for energy, for furniture systems, for carpeting, for leases, etc., we find that all of these costs or a very, very small percentage of the total cost to operate an office. In fact, 80 to 90 percent of the costs that operate an office are people costs. Costs for labor and wages and costs for benefits. We are driven then to look at people for two reasons. One, because people are the source of all productivity. And two, if we're to improve our performance, we must look at our highest cost factor and that is the human being. The whole process of gathering this information together has been called ergonomics. What it really is, 
is just good design, good management, and good training. But ergonomics gives the information necessary for us to have good training programs and good designs and good management. It tells us about what people need and what people can do and allows us to function from some hard criteria in developing our designs. If we are to develop our designs, if we're to develop our office workplaces to be productive, we have to look at it in a total context. And there are many, many parts to this system. One part is the task. We can design tasks that people can do. We can design tasks that people cannot do. The important thing for us to recognize today is that the way tasks have been interpreted must change because the introduction of office automation is rapidly changing task structures. Another part of the system is the environment. Issues related to noise, air quality, airflow, warmth, cold, vibration, all of these factors that affect the quality of the working environment and worker well-being. Then finally, there are aspects that we call the managed environment. You cannot weigh management policy in pounds or inches, but you can see its effects. Management policy re related to aspects such as how do we introduce change? Management issues such as once change has been introduced, how do we prepare people with training programs? How do we get involvement from people that are most important in the entire process, which are the people who are doing the work? We can see that the effective blending of tasks hardware and management programs directly impacts worker productivity. If we take the word productivity, we have to look at it critically. It's been our experience that productivity is probably the second most misused word after the word quality. Everybody knows that they want it, but very few people can define it. One of our objectives today will be to define in very clear terms what productivity is and what productivity isn't. To help us through this process, let's review a couple of surveys. In 1983, a survey of Fortune 500 companies indicated that less than 20% of the Fortune 500 group had any definition for office productivity. At that time, it was identified that only seven companies had any formal program to actually measure office performance. In 1985, the same survey was repeated, and all of the numbers increased radically, so that today, 20% of the Fortune 500 complement do have formalized office productivity programs, although the vast majority still do not. Let's add another piece of information to this whole puzzle. We identified that in 1983, most companies were satisfied with their office automation programs, and that in 1984, most of these Fortune 500 companies were not happy with their office automation programs. They were able to identify in 1983 that they had great expectations for office productivity. They had those expectations again in 1984, but they began to realize in 1985 that they weren't being achieved. It was also in 1985 that the federal government released a study that said that it could not find a strong relationship between dollars invested in office automation and improvements in office productivity. Spending a lot of money on machines did not improve your performance. So let's take a look then at what productivity will mean to us. We can take one measure of productivity as human error. Now we have to recognize that human error does not come from the human error gland somewhere behind the liver. Human error is the translation of the work environment and training and the tools you have to do the job into a performance. If it's what you want people to do, it's good performance. If it isn't what you want people to do, it's human error. And so if you have a particular task and you must do it many, many times, it becomes more costly to achieve that task. We recognize, therefore, that human error is responsive to the work environment, and that the number of times we have to do a job again and again will depend and reflect upon how much it costs us to do that job. That's one kind of error called captured error. You have to pay somebody to do the job, and somebody to find the errors, and somebody to fix them. There's another kind of error, which is called non-captured error. 
This is the kind of error that somebody makes, and it leaves your organization. Eventually, it could adversely affect what people think about your product and your corporate image. The issue about captured error and uncaptured error is that you have to pay somebody to do the job, you have to pay somebody to find the mistakes that the first person made, and you have to pay somebody to fix them. You have to pay three times to get the job done once. Now, that immediately leads to our next concept of productivity, which is called job cost. If we take all of our costs for people and the standing facility, we can work out a stringent definition of cost per unit time. Then, we start to take a look at how long it takes us to get a particular job done. We begin to find out that it costs us $300, sometimes $400, to develop a two-page memo. Another part of this whole process would relate to worker well-being. When I get up in the morning with real physical pain or emotional discomfort, I go through an evaluation process of cost and benefit as to whether or not I want to go to work. Sometimes it happens quite quickly in the time between it takes my head to look at the alarm clock and roll over on the pillow. But I'm evaluating the benefit of going to work and exposing myself to more discomfort or the benefit of staying home and not exposing myself to this discomfort. We all do it. The role of the office environment does not necessarily have to be one of encouraging people to come to work, but it minimally should not be one of denying people by causing them discomfort. The opportunity and drive to want to go to work is fundamental to being human and the environment should support that. If you have a situation where you are punishing people, you have a situation of absenteeism. And we contrast well-being with absenteeism because people who are not at work are not functioning and are not performing. That brings us finally to one other definition of productivity we're going to use today, which is percent machine use. If I have a certain investment in the training of a computer operator or in a manager, and I have a certain investment in hardware that I want these people to work with, the more time that they're working together, the greater my opportunity to recover my investment. Now, people are the reason why we don't have a linear flow of productivity in the office. Machines function in a linear manner. Eight hours is twice as much as four. But people don't function in that way. One of the limiting factors to people is fatigue or discomfort. And if we can remove that discomfort from the workplace, then we can increase our percent machine utilization, which affects then the amount of time that people are able to be on a task effectively. And immediately that has an effect on job cost. And as my added reward, we also see it affects our human error rate, which in return also affects our rework rate. Let's take this information and put it in the context of the office. We've developed the concept that environments must be user-friendly. What we mean by that is that they must support the capabilities of the human as opposed to being performance punishing. Performance punishing situations, what that really means is hurting people when they try to do a good job. And that might be hurting them physically or hurting them emotionally. So what we want to take a look at are user-friendly work environments. What we know is that furniture, such as this particular system, can help us accommodate problems of worker discomfort in the office environment. By design, we can have the viewing distance to the hard copy and the viewing distance to the screen at the same length. Rather than making the person work back and forth, back and forth, we have the machine do the work. We take the task, we take the job, and we fit it to the person. That's the whole point of ergonomics and the whole point of the ergonomics of office equipment, to take the job and the task and to fit them around human needs. One of the things we must recognize is how rapidly this equipment is coming into our workplace. Office automation equipment is entering the workplace about 100 times faster than the ballpoint pen did. In fact, a Dun & Bradstreet survey indicate that all of the estimates that have been developed for office automation saturation were wrong. 
that in fact the number of computers going into the workplace are about six times greater than the estimates. This phenomenon we term the information explosion. The information explosion then has changed the entire ecology of the office environment. We have people, we have automated equipment, and something must bridge the two. The first thing that bridges the two is the chair. Seating is rapidly rocketing itself into the workplace. Even though we've had seating around for a couple of hundred years, now more than ever, we're becoming a sedentary worker population. We are professional sitters. And as professional sitters, whether I'm the president of a company or whether I work in the stock room, from the switchboard to the chairman of the board, I require a professional sitting device. As a professional sitting device, it must support my needs as a human because my needs as a human have undergone change. Moving to a sedentary lifestyle has produced a whole new kind of human, homo sedens, the seated human. Along with the chair rapidly rocketing into our workplace comes the computer terminal. One day I come into work and I'm working on a typewriter. The next day I come into the workplace and I'm working on a computer. We conducted a study of 4,000 office workers that use computer equipment and 4,000 that use conventional clerical equipment. What this study showed us is that those people that use video display terminals have significantly more discomfort in the neck and shoulders than those people that do not. According to all laws of science, validity, reliability, etc., we were able to identify that the introduction of computer terminals into the workplace brought with it a lot of discomfort. When we review the visual environment in which many people have to work with computers, we see that the computer screen often is full of glare and characters are very small. In the same study, we were able to identify that those people that use video display terminals had about twice as much eye strain and reported eye discomfort as those people that did not. The role of the furniture system is to adapt the task for the human being. So that rather than having to make the person adopt uncomfortable postures and force the person into uncomfortable positions, we make the furniture adapt to the human being. We take the task and we fit it to the human. What we've seen is that the introduction of ergonomic furniture has significantly reduced discomfort in the neck and shoulders, and it's reduced eye strain. Up until this point, most of what we've been discussing has related to the clerical worker and to data entry tasks. As we go now and look at different tasks in the office, we see that the ergonomic criteria change. Up until now, we've been interpreting the office as an information factory. And most clerical tasks are information factory tasks. Productivity measures have been related to keystroke rate, error rate, some fairly reductionistic terms. But as we start to look at different task categories, such as the dialogue task, where I interact with the computer, and I interact with other people, I interact with the telephone, we see that the requirements for the office environment are evolving. As we progress to another category, data inquiry, we see that the computer is taking a secondary position in the office environment. The important thing is to use the computer to retrieve information and then to share that information with other people. What has happened in the transition from the data entry to the data dialogue and to the inquiry stage is that the hierarchies of the office are changing. The hierarchy of the office used to demand many, many people to gather information together so that a few people could make decisions. Decision-making levels, because of technology, are compressing downward into the organization. And clerical people, through changes in job demands, and because of education and freedom from repeti repetitive tasks, are compressing upward into the organization. And what is evolving and emerging in the middle is a whole new class of office worker called the knowledge worker. It's probably one of the fastest growing classes of workers in North America. It's also probably one of the most expensive. This is the professional category. Managerial people, engineers, technical specialists. 
Today, perhaps 4 to 5 percent of these people have direct access to a computer in their work environment. But in the next few years, we'll be seeing a rapid increase in the number of people that will be directly working with a computer, until finally, 100 percent of these people will have direct access to a computer. These are the people that are changing office tasks from an information factory to a decision center. When we talk about office productivity, we must be certain about what kind of productivity we're talking about. With clerical tasks, we look at keystroke rate, and it's a time to complete a document. But when we come to the decision center, we start to look at the quality of what's done. Furniture is an important factor because it is the bridge between office automation technology and people. The real question for you is how to take all of these concepts, user-friendly, ergonomics of furniture, data entry, dialogue, data inquiry, and sum them up into one meaningful sentence or phrase. Well, that phrase is office productivity. The office environment cannot, in and of itself, create productivity where there is no potential for productivity. It cannot train people to be smarter than they are, and it cannot provide better management programs. However, good training and good management can be inhibited by poor office environments, or they can be supported by good office environments. That's the major role of office furniture, to provide that bridge between office automation and people, to provide that bridge between technology and tasks, it's also to provide the stage from which people can perform, to provide a stage upon which people can achieve their greatest productive potential, and provide the place where we all interact. Now the real question is who's going to pay for this stage? Well, let's take a look at a return on investment calculation based upon increased human performance, and determine how long it takes us to pay for a good stage, or as to say, for good office furniture. Let's explore what a 5% improvement in productivity really means. 5% improvement is very conservative. A 5% improvement in productivity is really quite straightforward when you look at it in terms of time. During a working day, we've got about 480 minutes. Surveys have shown us that we don't work all that time. Some people work about six hours of that time, but the majority only work five. That means we're dealing with about 300 minutes a day of potential work. A 5% increase in productivity is only 15 minutes a day. 15 more minutes on task, 15 more minutes at the desk, instead of 15 minutes looking through glare. 15 more minutes of a manager finding information that he or she is looking for and 15 minutes less a day wandering around lost. It's a very, very small amount of time. But if you take a 5% improvement in productivity, which as we said is only 15 minutes a day, and you take our costs for people, which are around thirty to $33,000 with benefits, this 5% increase in productivity is very powerful. What you find is that you are improving their performance, their value-added productivity, by around $1,000 a year. In some cases more, some cases less, but around $1,000 a year of cost avoidance. If we take a look at the cost for buying a quality office environment with good ergonomic attributes versus the cost of buying a conventional office environment, these differences in cost are recovered by the increased productivity in seven to eight months. The differential in cost is recovered by the impressive improvements in economy that come from small improvements in human productivity. We now start looking at office environments as an investment and not as a cost. And we recognize that the office environment is that vital bridge, that stage, if you will, upon which people can perform better and this translates into a very immediate and real return to the corporate bottom line. In so doing, management has an opportunity to take the investment in office furniture and translate that investment into both worker well-being and performance enhancement 
that can be directly justified through a bottom line return and rate of return. In anyone's books, an investment in a quality office environment directly equates into a formula for corporate productivity and corporate success. Thank you, Franz. And that's correct. Our furniture systems are an active support mechanism for the productivity improvements that can be made and must be made to improve the total office environment. If our clients are to prepare their companies for the productivity improvements of the information age, first and foremost, they will have to consider the human factor. They will have to develop flexible workspaces respondent to change and ergonomic workspaces aesthetically pleasing and respondent to the needs of people. One of the major strengths of our system is that we are not limited by the product in terms of how to express those relationships. A lot of discussion has gone into centerline modularity and space savings. But an equally important factor is that we provide a toolkit for office productivity. Tools to support people and equipment. Tools that are extremely flexible and not limited by the hardware. Tools that allow the space planner to express the intricate relationships of a client's individual corporate requirements. Whether you're looking to create an environment where people interact, or whether you're looking to create an environment where people require privacy, the opportunities to respond are there. An important factor that positions Westinghouse Furniture Systems as a totally unique furniture manufacturer is that we have incorporated into our products and systems the productivity lessons learned from our own experience. John Nesbitt has published a new book. As a follow-up to Megatrends, his new work, Reinventing the Corporation, describes how to prepare a company for the new information society. A few of the quotes are an excellent summary to what we have been discussing here. The turmoil of the 1970s, the stiff competition of a global economy and the declining industrial base, represents the economic impetus for change. And the new forces, such as the coming seller's market for skilled employees, the whittling away of middle management, and the new definition of human resources as a company's competitive edge, are reinforcing that economic imperative. At Westinghouse, we can see our role as assisting companies to respond to the new economic imperatives by providing solutions for productivity. To close from Nesbitt, the only way to translate a corporate vision into people's day-to-day -day behavior is by grounding those lofty concepts in the company's day-to-day -day environment. Oh.